Good, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the session. I know that uh, some people are still coming back in from uh, coffee, but uh, in order to keep on time, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Peter Hansen from the Gabby Alliance on the session of this chair. Uh, the session, as you know, focuses on uh, measuring effective coverage. We'll explore the complexities, challenges, and innovation related to measuring effective coverage take into account issues of quality and completeness of services received. Effective coverage is a critical link in the results chain since it connects outputs, which are more readily measured over a short time period, uh, to the ultimate goal of affecting health at the population level, which can take several years to observe. Uh, the panel today consists of four different uh, speakers here seated to my right. Uh, the first is uh, Bharat uh, Randiv from the R.D. Gardi Medical College, India, and uh, Umea University of Sweden. Uh, he'll be presenting on effective coverage of institutional deliveries under the JSY program in high maternal mortality states of India. Uh, Bharat will be followed by uh, Tanya Marchant from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, who will present on measuring skilled attendance at birth using linked household, health facility, and health worker surveys uh, from three countries, uh, Ethiopia, Northeastern Nigeria, and uh, Uttar Pradesh, India. Uh, the third speaker is Ellie Colson uh, from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Uh, she'll be uh, presenting on comparative estimates of coverage from three different interventions. And uh, last but not least, uh, Divakar Yadav from FHI 360 will present on retention and dropout uh, within India's universal immunization program. Each of the presenters will have 15 minutes and 15 slides. We'll go through the four in an inter un uninterrupted manner uh, and then have 20 minutes for discussion and questions and comments. Uh, Bharat, over to you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to present my study here. I'm presenting on effective coverage of institutional deliveries under the JSY program in high maternal mortality provinces of India. This slide presents, this slide shows the distribution of burden of maternal deaths. India accounted for 19% of global maternal deaths in 2010. And within India, nine provinces with poor health indicators contribute 62% of maternal deaths in the country. To address the issue of slow decline in maternal mortality, India adapted a strategy of skill but attendance by providing, by promoting institutional deliveries. In 2005, Government of India launched a scheme called uh, Janni Suraksha Yojana. Janni Suraksha Yojana is a conditional cash transfer program, popularly known as JSY in the nine provinces with low levels of institutional delivery. JSY provides a cash incentive to all mothers giving birth in public or accredited private health facility. In the nine provinces with low levels of institutional delivery, JSY provides a cash incentive to all mothers on delivering in public or accredited private health facilities. JSY is underpinned on two major assumptions. First, the cash incentive will enable women to overcome financial barriers to access institutional delivery. And second, increased institutional births will reduce maternal deaths by timely access to emergency obstetric care. Based on these two assumptions, in 2005, this scheme was launched. And India has made huge uh, investment on, since last seven years on this scheme. And its monitoring has remained restricted only to the crude coverage, that is, proportion of births in the institutions. However, mere 
coverage does not equate to health gains rather quality of coverage is important and in this study we are using effective coverage as a indicator to monitor the performance of jsy while crude co sorry while crude coverage is a indicator to monitor the performance of jsy crude coverage is the proportion of need and utilization while effective coverage is combined function of need utilization and quality this study is uh, st this study include nine provinces of india with high maternal mortality burden and these nine provinces constitute half of india's population 59% births and 62% maternal deaths comes from this part and this analysis is based on data from annual health survey conducted by government of india we surveyed 18 million people in 3.6 million household from the nine provinces we measured the effective coverage of institutional birth in jsy using three important construct need utilization and quality where need is total deliveries in defined area and time utilization is num number of mothers in the institu institution utilization is total number of mothers deliver in the health facilities and quality is emergency obstetric care availability we are considering emoc availability as a proxy to the quality of institutional care because institutional care is expected to reduce maternal mortality by providing timely access to emergency obstetric care and probability of this emergency obstetric care availability when needed determines the delivery outcomes hence we are using emoc availability as a proxy to the quality of this intervention in the absence of data on all emoc functions we are using cesarean rate as a proxy to emoc availability who and other agencies have estimated need of cesarean in minimum 5% births so we are considering 5% c section as a 100% emoc need met and based on this we estimated effective coverage of institutional deliveries in all 284 districts of this nine provinces as a product of c section rate in as a proportion of 100% need met and crude coverage so effective coverage based on this formula effective coverage will be for the district for the districts effective coverage is a product of district cesarean rate as a proportion of minimum 5% need and proportion of need and utilization so based on this formula we have estimated effective coverage for all 284 districts this slide shows the trends after the implementation of jsy this slide shows the trends in nine provinces during the first five years of jsy institutional birth proportion increased in all nine provinces and the magnitude of increase is twice to thrice across the provinces from baseline at 2005 prior to jsy assuming minimum need of 5% c section you can see in this chart graph in up in about half of the district that is 139 districts there is a gap between crude and effect there is no gap between crude and effective coverage as, as seen in the top most bar because these districts have c section rate equal to or more than 5% minimum indicating mothers delivering in health facilities have access to emoc all the mothers delivering in this 139 districts have access to emoc but remaining 145 districts there was a gap of 18 percent points between the this crude and effective coverage that means despite delivering in health facilities 
there were about 36% mothers who did not have access to emergency obstetric care. If segregated province wise, this gap ranged from 1% point in Uttarakhand to 25% in Madhya Pradesh. Assuming C-section need in 10% births rather than most conservative estimate of 5%, we found only 29 districts, that means around 10% districts, have effective coverage and crude coverage, equal effective and crude coverage in the topmost bar, while in the rest 90% districts, that is 255 districts, there was a gap of 30% point between these two, meaning more than half mothers delivering in the health facilities did not have access to EMOC. Segregated analysis by province level shows the gap is ranged from 15% point to 45% point and is high in the provinces which shows sharp increase in institutional birth after the JSY. To estimate crude and effective coverage among public deliver, public uh, delivery in the public health facilities, because in India public health facilities are the major provider of maternity care, based mostly in these provinces, we analyze this da uh, data for the public facilities separately. Assuming minimum 5% C-section need in public facilities, we found in 139 districts, as shown in the topmost bar. Median for both crude and effective coverage was 39% and which was 62% in, uh, in the total. While in the remaining 145 district, there was a gap of 25% points. And same that meaning that many percentage mothers do not have if, uh, access to emergency obstetric care. Assuming minimum C-section need in 10% in 10% uh, C-section need, we found that 31 districts, the median for both crude and effective coverage was 32%, while in the remaining 253 districts, there was a gap of 27% points between these two. So the gap is again high in the, uh, the provinces, which have sharp increase in uh, institutional delivery after the JSY. In addition to this estimation, effective estimation of epitic coverage, we also studied the association of social demographic factors for, uh, with effective coverage. And this regression model showed literacy and urbanization are positively associated with effective coverage, while poverty and fertility were uh, negatively associated with it. So to conclude, there was a gap between crude and effective coverage of institutional deliveries in 90% of districts indicating widespread shortage of emergency obstetric care services in high maternal mortality provinces of India. And despite delivering in health facility, more than half mothers do not have access to emergency obstetric care. Provinces showing sharp increase in institutional deliveries have higher gap between crude and effective coverage indicating of indi indicating inability of supply side to adequately meet the demand raised by JSY. Effective coverage is better in a district with more urban and literate population, meaning access to EMOC is available mainly in urban areas. Although JSY has increased crude, uh, coverage of institutional birth, there is an urgent need to improve the effective coverage, and effective coverage should be considered as a better indicator to monitor JSY performance rather than crude coverage. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to speak today about measuring skilled attendance birth at birth and using linked 
household, health facility, and health worker information. And I'm focusing much more on the more basic levels of obstetric care, um, in contrast to Barrett, who was talking about emergency care. So we know that there's an increasing trend towards uh, um, seeking skilled attendance at birth and towards delivering in institutions globally. And here we have photos of three women from three very rural and high mortality settings. On the left, we have Minakshi from Uttar Pradesh. In the middle, we have Hadiza from Gombe State in the northeast of Nigeria. And on the right, we have Della from Ethiopia. These three women all did the right thing. They're success stories. They all delivered their last child in a primary health facility with a skilled birth attendant. And we think of them as success stories because we know from available evidence that up to 50% of obstetric-related mortality could be reduced by those actions, by the choices they made. So what is the measurement problem? Well, in public health, if you think that what gets measured is what gets done, then we have a problem in skilled attendance at birth because we simply don't measure enough. The skilled attendants are individuals, medical professionals. They're not life-saving behaviors of themselves. And the women who are accessing skilled birth attendants rely on their actions, rely on how prepared they are, and also rely on the environments in which that skilled attendance is going to take place. So in the literature for at least the last 10 years, there's been a call to try to unpack what we mean by skilled attendance at birth, to unpack the measurement that goes with it. Beyond what we have currently, which is on a large scale, population level coverage of the percentage of women who had skilled birth attendants, or from a facility basis, the percentage of facilities that are prepared and ready to deliver um, maternity services. There are some smaller scale observational studies that probably provide us with a better gold standard for measuring skilled attendance at birth, but they're difficult to replicate on a large scale. So we wanted to simply ask the question, what can we do to improve the measurement of skilled attendance at birth by linking data sources. So, and as I said, I'm thinking about three really quite basic elements of care. And you can extend this to uh, include much more complex and emergency um, life-saving care. But just from a very first starting point, are the health facilities ready to deliver care that we're at the places where the skilled birth attendants are working? And can we adjust for the number of births that are taking place in those ready health facilities? And then secondly, about the skilled birth attendants themselves, are they prepared? And can we go towards estimating an effective coverage measure of skilled birth attendants with prepared birth attendants? And then finally, can we ask what proportion of skilled birth attendants actually administered a prophylactic uterotonic to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, one of the major causes of maternal mortality around the world? And can we go further to say not just how many skilled birth attendants do this, but what's the effective coverage? Okay. So a quick mo mo uh, mention about methods. This work was carried out within the context of a measurement, learning, and evaluation grant called the IDEAS Project, which works in Ethiopia, Northeast Nigeria, and in Uttar Pradesh in India, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'd be very happy to talk to anybody who'd be interested to hear more about that project um, later throughout the conference. So this is just one small component of the work that we do. In 2012, we collected data across these three geographies just applying quite standard methodologies for cluster-based household surveys, but also surveying the primary health facilities that provide maternity services to those household clusters, and identifying the health workers who provide maternally, maternal and newborn health services to those household clusters. 
We interviewed across a whole range of cadre of health worker, and I'm going to focus today just on those who were defined as a skilled birth attendant. We tried to take care to make sure that our instruments were compatible with other large-scale survey instruments. So it's a modular approach to a household survey that included a module with detailed sets of questions for women who'd had a birth in the last 12 months. In the household, sorry, in the facility survey, we had a long list of instruments that we checked for availability and functionality of, but also collect information about the volume of births that were taking place in those facilities just by extracting data from uh, maternity registers. And then in the health worker survey, we collected information about their training, their supervision and skills, but also paid particular attention to asking them about the last birth that they'd attended. So first country, Uttar Pradesh, shown here in the map on the right and showing the dots of our clusters. This data is not representative across the whole of Uttar Pradesh. We had six districts that we surveyed from. We visited over 5,000 households, interviewed 604 women in detail about their last birth, interviewed 62 skilled birth attendants who were identified as providing uh, maternity care to those households, and surveyed 60 primary health facilities. And from this data, we found that 76% of the women we interviewed had delivered with a skilled birth attendant in the last year, and 79% had delivered in a health facility. And these findings are quite consistent with other data that's available for those six districts. Then in northeast Nigeria, we were in the state of Gombe in the northeast of Nigeria. Again, they're showing the, uh, the dots for our, our sample clusters. Here we went to almost 2,000 households, interviewed 349 women with a recent live birth, identified and interviewed 20 skilled birth attendants and surveyed 25 primary health facilities. Here, the percentage of women who delivered with a skilled birth attendant in the last year was 22%, and 30% are delivered in a, uh, in a health facility. And then finally, in Ethiopia, we sampled from across the four main populous regions of Ethiopia, Amhara, Oromia, Tigray, and SNMP, and went to over 4,000 households, 533 women, 77 skilled birth attendants, and 81 primary health facilities. The coverage of skilled birth attendants is lowest across the three geographies in Ethiopia, again, consistent with what we already know from DHS and other surveys. It was estimated to be 16% amongst this group of women, 15% of whom had delivered in a health facility. Okay, so that's the setting for the work. So to address the first question, amongst women who were delivering in a primary health facility, like Minakshi, like Hadiza, like Della, the women we saw in the first slide, what percentage of the facilities that they accessed actually were ready to, for infection prevention. So as I said, I've really chosen very basic indicators here. So readiness for infection prevention, meaning that they had access to the five items. <clears throat> the area that I want to focus on is the area in green. So these are the facilities, in this donut represents 100% of the facilities that we surveyed. And those in green represent the proportion of facilities that were assigned to provide services, were providing them on the day of survey, and had those five basic items for infection prevention available on the day of survey. Conversely, the area in red are the other extreme. They are the facilities that were assigned to provide services, were not providing services on the day of survey, and anyway, had some essential basic items missing. Okay, so that's the donut. And this is what it looks like for the other three countries. Less, a less positive picture, we have about around two-thirds of primary care facilities being ready for infection prevention in Uttar Pradesh, but only around one-third of facilities in northeast Nigeria and in Ethiopia being ready for infection prevention. We want to add value to this knowledge. 
So adjusting for the volume of births that were taking place in those facilities over the last six months, having just extracted um, birth information from the routine registers that were available in the facilities, we saw that almost all women who delivered in a primary health facility in Uttar Pradesh did deliver in one that was ready for clean care, but only half of them in Ethiopia, but half of the births that took place in those facilities in Ethiopia took place in a facility that was ready to deliver clean care. So now moving on to the skilled birth attendants. In this figure, we have on the left-hand side three columns, one for each country, orange Uttar Pradesh, green Northeast Nigeria, and blue Ethiopia. So on the left-hand side is the percentage of skilled birth attendants we spoke to who had been able to prepare a basic set of items for maternal and newborn care at the last delivery that they attended. And what we see is that in Uttar Pradesh, only 16% of the skilled birth attendants had been able to prepare all of these basic items, 8% in northeast Nigeria, far better in Ethiopia with 45% of skilled birth attendants saying that they'd prepared all of these items for their last birth. And then we'd ask them about the actions that they'd taken during that birth, one of which was whether or not they'd administered a prophylactic uterotonic. So we saw that in Uttar Pradesh and in Ethiopia, around half of the skilled birth attendants said yes, they had, and two thirds in Northeast Nigeria said that they had. So again, we want to try and add some value to this information by linking it to what we know about skilled birth attendants at the population level. Okay. So in this figure, we have three columns, again one for each country, Uttar Pradesh, Northeast Nigeria, and Ethiopia. And it's just the cumulative frequency of women by birth attendant. The green area being those, the percentage of women who had no skilled birth attendant, and the blue area being the percentage of women who did have a skilled birth attendant. But the dark blue area now adjusts for what we know about what the skilled birth attendants reported about the behavior at the last birth they attended in the areas where the women were living. And we clearly observe a marked reduction in the effective coverage of um, uterotonic amongst women who had a skilled attendant at birth. It's actually reduced by half in Uttar Pradesh from 76% of women who had a skilled birth attendant to just 38% of women who had a skilled birth attendant and can be expected to have received a uterotonic. Our other question was about how well prepared the frontline work, the, the skilled birth attendants were. So here we see a more dramatic gap between the coverage of skilled birth attendant and the coverage of skilled birth attendants with a birth attendant who was prepared to deliver quality care. So I don't think I can sit in front of a, or stand in front of a room of evaluators without talking about limitations. Inevitably, we do have some using this approach. So first of all, with the, um, with the, within the Ideas Project, the survey only extended to primary level care, and that was probably adequate in Ethiopia and in Nigeria, but probably we could have done more in Uttar Pradesh by including higher levels of care. And the facility readiness only reflects what we saw on the day of survey, and that's common for any cross-sectional approach. Also, by asking birth attendants about what they did at the last birth, without any observation, it's very likely that there's an upward bias in their reporting, and what we're seeing is a, the upper bound of effective coverage. And also that in, in, by applying what birth attendants said they did at the last birth to the population of women, we have to acknowledge that we're not measuring um, indicators for individual women. But what did we learn? We learned that for thinking back to our three women, to Minakshi, um, Hadija, and Della, for women like Minakshi, her neighbors, the women around her, almost all of them who had an institutional delivery 
did deliver in a facility that was ready to, uh, for infection prevention. Whereas for women like Khadija in Nigeria, only 40% of the women benefited from delivering in, a, in an institution with regards to infection prevention. And then looking at the skilled birth attendants, when we actually unpack that to estimate just two examples of effective coverage, we see enormous gaps between the success that we record in skilled attendance at birth and the coverage of life-saving interventions. And I think the reason this is important is because for those of us who care about the lives of Munakshi, Hadija, and Della, we need to move beyond working towards the ever encouraging and increasing trend of increases in coverage of skilled attendance at birth and start focusing on what we can do to close these gaps. Thank you. Measuring intervention coverage in low resource settings is challenging. Household surveys are the basis for global monitoring of child and maternal health indicators in developing countries. However, their depiction of coverage is inadequate. Today I'm going to present results from the baseline evaluation of the Mesoamerican Health Initiative 2015, which is using innovative data collection methods to better understand effective coverage. I think you'll find a lot of parallels between my talk and the previous two talks, so I'm really excited to share these results with you. The Mesoamerican Health Initiative, or SM2015, is a results-based financing program managed by the Inter-American Development Bank. The program provides financial incentives to eight ministries of health in Central America to improve child and maternal health outcomes for the poorest populations. IHME is collecting a variety of baseline data in areas where these interventions will be rolled out. The results I'm presenting today come from the state of Chiapas in Mexico. In Mexico, we conducted a household survey. So we sampled localities and first conducted our own census to identify households with women and children. In the household survey, we gathered information on child health and maternal health and collected information on anthropometry and dried blood spot samples. We also collected data from 90 health facilities. This in incorporated a health facility survey, observation of equipment functioning and drug supplies, and medical record review of pregnancies, births, and diarrhea cases in the last two years. In Panama, we're also collecting data on water quality. And in Costa Rica, a, a school-based survey of reproductive health. Some of the unique aspects of the SM2015 evaluation are the large sample sizes of data that we're collecting in high-risk areas. For example, in Chiapas, we're collecting data on more than three times more women and children in poor areas than the most recent National Health and Nutrition Survey. We're also capturing data electronically on netbooks, which allows us to reduce errors and have immediate access to the data. This in turn allows us to conduct rapid automated data quality checks and provide immediate feedback to our field teams. In our household survey, we ask all respondents for the name and location of every single health facility that they report attending. This allows us to link households to health facilities for different types of care. Our detailed health facility observation checklist and medical record review are also unique in this context. And our dried blood spot samples will allow us to compare uh, survey-based estimates of vaccination coverage to antibody presence. So my goal for today is to use SM2015 data to illustrate how household surveys provide us with an incomplete picture of effective coverage. I'll discuss antenatal care, contraceptive prevalence, and vaccination coverage. I'll highlight some of the biggest challenges in measuring effective coverage of these interventions and suggest steps that could be taken to improve their measurement. So the first indicator I'll discuss is antenatal care. Antenatal care is most commonly measured as the proportion of women receiving one or four visits during their pregnancy. This is a very basic measure. An ideal measure of effective coverage would incorporate not only visits, but the content and quality of those visits, and ultimately, the health outcomes. 
Towards this end, we collaborated with the Inter-American Development Bank and the Mexican Ministry of Health to define a list of best practices that should be included in the content of antenatal care. These best practices included basic low technology checks like measuring weight and blood pressure, as well as certain lab tests that should be performed once during pregnancy, for example, testing a woman's blood type. Then, in the household survey, we collected information on the number of visits, gestational age at first visit, medical personnel attendance at every visit, not just any visit, and the contents of those visits. On the health facility side, we captured information on skilled attendance, as well as very detailed information for each visit on, uh, on a, the content of those visits according to the best practices we defined. So in the household, from household data, we found that 73% of women attend any health facility for, during, ante, during their pregnancy for antenatal care. And from, house, from health facility data, we know that most of these women saw a doctor or a nurse. However, when we incorporate those basic checks that we defined into the definition of the indicator, we find that coverage drops dramatically in these areas. And when we require that five such visits occur, which is in accordance with the Mexican medical norm, we find that coverage drops even further. And finally, if we require that health facilities meet all the best practices we defined, only 4% of women make the cut. We also found large differences when we compared the content of visits that women report versus what we see in health facilities. Since we asked women where they went for antenatal care, we could match 400 women with 32 of the facilities that we surveyed. Now the proportions I'm presenting here are weighted to account for differences in the number of women reporting about each facility and the number of medical records that we extracted from each facility. So we found that 40% of women attending a health facility reported a visit in the first trimester. But according to medical records, that value was only 8%. Likewise, when we asked about blood pressure, fundal height measurement, syphilis testing, and blood glucose testing, women report consistently less checks than are recorded in medical records. And all of these differences are statistically significant. And these patterns are true for many of the other indicators that I'm not listing here as well that we included in best practices. Now the SM2015 indicator that we use to define effective coverage isn't a perfect measure. Just receiving appropriate chests and checks does not mean that the health personnel responded appropriately to those checks, nor does it necessarily imply that there were health gains. And medical records are not the gold standard source of information on antenatal care, but they are informative, and they are highlighting important differences between coverage and effective coverage, and between what women say about their care and what health facilities show about their care. These are important differences because we don't know which of these sources is accurate, if either. But we do know that there are differences and that sometimes these differences are large. And so we should be cautious in relying solely on what women say. The next indicator I'd like to discuss is contraceptive prevalence. One of the most common indicators of, contraceptive pro of contraception is modern contraceptive use among women in need. Need can be defined in many different ways, but usually refers to the married or partnered women who are fecund but not pregnant or trying to become pregnant. Now, modern contraceptive prevalence refers to current use, and it masks potentially important variation in the consistency of, of use. So for example, 50% prevalence could mean that 50% of women use contraception consistently, and the other 50% have no exposure or it could mean that 75% of women have some exposure to contraceptives, but their use or supply is inconsistent, such that at the time of the survey, only 50% of women are covered. These two scenarios have very different implications, and so capturing the, these interruptions is important. So in our household survey, we asked women not only about their current use, but about use in the past year. We found that injectables and female sterilization were the most common methods of contraception. On the health facility side, we also wanted to know what stocks of family planning health facilities had and whether they'd had any stock outs in the past three months. We found that most health facilities had at least condoms, pills, and injectables in stock, but that many of them were experiencing stock outs. 
A particular interest is in injectables because they're commonly used among women and, and because they, were, they have the highest rates of stockouts of the methods that we observed. Also of interest is that almost 30% of facilities report stocking emergency contraception. And yet no women report use of this method in the past year. So when we put this information together, we find that 62% of women reported any use of contraception in the past year. But only 60, and 61% reported use without interruptions. This means that 98% of women did not have any interruptions. So this is good news. But at the same time, we're finding that only 59% of facilities had basic stocks of contraceptives. And only 39% had supplies without stockouts. So again, we're seeing an inconsistent story here. We're seeing women with very few interruptions and facilities with lots of stockouts. Perhaps in this scenario, women don't know when their, their coverage is interrupted. More investigation would be needed here uh, to, to find out the truth. But I wanted to highlight that there is a large gap. The third indicator I'd like to talk about is the vaccination coverage. Vaccination coverage from household surveys typically gathers data on children's health cards and relies on caregiver recall when those health cards are unavailable. In contrast, in the SM2015 survey, we asked for caregiver recall of all ch for all children and captured child health cards for any children that had them available. This means that we were able to compare card-based estimates to recall-based estimates for the same children. This table represents those results for the 75% of children in our sample for whom we had both card and recall information. The vaccines that I present here are a select subset and they're in accordance with the Mexican vaccination scheme. We find that recall-based estimates consistently are lower than card-based estimates. This is really important because it means that survey-based estimates of vaccination coverage depend on the proportion of the sample that have health cards. So two, two surveys on the same population with the same level of coverage could have different levels of survey-based coverage depending on how heavily they rely on recall versus card. Moreover, recall and card are both imperfect estimates of vaccination coverage. Only serological surveys can tell us the true effective coverage of vaccination. And the children who don't have health cards are not represented in this table. And only measurements of effective coverage using serological surveys can tell us how biased those results are as well. And if we really want to understand how, why gaps in effective coverage of vaccination are occurring, we also need to look at supply side factors that aren't captured in household surveys. Towards this end, we looked at what the infrastructure health facilities had uh, to store and deliver vaccines. We also looked at what vaccines they had in stock. And we found that less than half of the facilities in our sample actually store vaccines. Many of them just hold vaccines for extremely short periods of time prior to delivery. Of those that are storing vaccines, most have functional infrastructure to store them, but they have suboptimal electricity. This means that they either don't have electricity for all hours of the day, or they don't have enough power to power all of the equipment that they have. We also found that many of the facilities are not stocking all of the recommended vaccines. So the good news is that we're seeing decently high levels of coverage in vaccination according to the household survey. But it raises the question of how well and how well equipped the health system is to fully vaccinate children given the conditions that we're seeing in facilities. As we analyze our serological data and map children's attendance at health facilities and examine temperature monitoring charts from these health facilities, we'll be able to better examine this disconnect. So bringing this information together, there's a couple key points that I'd like to make. The first is that we saw large discrepancies in estimates of coverage and factors related to coverage between household and health facility data. This is a theme that we saw in our other talks as well. And these discrepancies highlight that we need more investigation and validation of all of these sources to understand what the true levels of coverage are. And some of this investigation may require new tools and methods. Second point I'd like to make is that there are large differences between coverage and effective coverage. 
Again, I'm happy to see this as a theme everyone is highlighting. This was especially true for antenatal care and highlights the, the, how urgent it is that we incorporate quality into our measures of coverage. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that accurate measurement of effective coverage is really critical. It's critical because we use these measures for decision making, priority setting, and benchmarking in global health. Accurate measurement is important because it's the only way that we can assure that women and children are receiving the services they need. Thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. Myself, Divakar Yadav, and I'm going to present the paper on the children immunization, and my co-author is Dr. Chandrasekhar, and he was my PhD guide at IAPS. So the title is the India's Universal Immunization Program to Prevent Children from Preventable Disease, Retention and Dropout Approach. So before going into in depth in this research issue, uh, the whole study is divided into the five parts. First is the background, second is the objective, third is methods, fourth is results, and fifth is conclusion. And this is the background about the detail. Near about the 25% of the under five mortality is attributed to vaccine preventable disease around the world. And the childhood vaccines remain one of the most efficient public health initiatives, yet approximately 34 million children are not completely immunized, and almost 98% of them reside in developing countries. Children immunization awards an estimated 2 to 3 million deaths every year from polio, DPT, and measles. And around the, most of the children live in the mostly in 10 countries, including India. The immunization also makes economic sense in terms of the scaling of the use of existing vaccines in 72 of the world's poorest country. Could save 6.4 million lives and avert $6.2 billion in treatment cost and $145 billion in productivity losses between 2011-2020. And in India, the universal immunization program was integrated with the reproductive child health program to improve childhood immunization. But still, there is debate how to improve the children immunization level in India through the National Population Policy 2000 and National Health Policy 2002. But still, there is a lack of empirical researches on understanding about the childhood immunization by standard schedule of WHO. And to fulfill this research title, there is a two specific objective, to assess the coverage of immunization among children aged 12 to 23 months, and also to estimate the levels of retention and dropout from one vaccination to the next among uh, aged 12 to 23 months. And this is the method section where we utilize the nationwide district level household and facility survey conducted in the 2007 and 8. It covers 596 administrative districts in India and also approximately covered 64,000 children aged 12 to 23 months. And we adopted the WHO Children Immunization Schedule Guideline. And to assess the retention rate of children immunization, we used the kaplan meier method. Here, I want to show you the uh, schedule of the children vaccination from, till, from the births till the nine month of the age of the children. First vaccination, uh, vaccination is highlighted by the red section. The next one is the OPV1 and the DPT1 section. Uh, vaccination was uh, covered in the first six uh, weeks of the children, and then it followed by the OPV1 and DPT1 in the next uh, a week and then it followed by the OPV, OPV1 and DPT, OPV3 and DPT3, and also it, uh, at the last, in the ninth month, it is uh, conducted by the measles vaccination. And here, 
uh, this approach is adopted by the Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and I have just want to show you the how I just conceptualize the calculate the children immunization according to schedule and the dropouts. The table one shows that the dose one is stands for the BCG, dose two stands for the DPT-1 and polio-1 com combined, and then dose three is DPT-2 plus polio-2, dose four is DPT-3 plus polio-3, and dose five stands for the measles. And then table two is represents how we just adopted to uh, conclude at the retention rate and the dropout rate of the children immunization in India. The dose one is stands for the BCG exclusively. Then dose one, two is combination of the dose one plus DPT one and polio one. Dose one, two, three is stands for the dose one, two plus DPT two plus polio two. Dose one, two, three, four stands for the dose one, two, three plus DPT three plus polio three. And dose one, two, three, four, five includes the dose one, two, three, four plus measles, means the whole nine vaccinations. And here, the results. Uh, the whole study is divided into the four background characteristics. First is the type of residence. Second is the region, geographically, on the basis of the geography. The sec third one is the wealth quintile of the household. And fourth one is the mother's education. So first, graph showing the type of residence where we can show that the round circle is uh, showing the levels of the dpt1 dpt2 and uh, uh, sorry polio1 and polio2 levels whereas at the national level in india there is a 52.5% is the fully immunized children at the national level whereas in the rural area it is the below the national average and if you look at about the next uh, graph which represent the geographically position and it is categorized into the six division, namely the south, no north, central, eastern, northeast and west, western part of the India. You can uh, saw in the last column it is circled by whereas it is the uh, level of the full immigration it is very low below the national average, approximately 36 percent, whereas in the southern part of the India it is the near about the 77 percent and if you look at about the by wealth quintile in the lowest wealth quintile again it is near about the 36 percent but if we are talking about the highest wealth quintile it is near about the 73 percent and now it's turn about the mother's education again it's a same same to the earlier hypothesis we used and then the next slide is <coughs> stands for the children immunization according to schedule which we adopted. In the first graph, we showed that the national level, it is almost same, but if you look at about the dose three and dose four, there is a larger gap, larger difference between the dose three and dose four. And similar levels, similar differences you can show, saw in this by the geographically region, and it also clearly focused in the uh, by the wealth quintile of the household, and it also shows in the by the mother's education where we can saw the difference between the dose three and dose four. And the next slide is representing the retention rate, how the children's if enters in the uh, children immunization schedule, but at the last moment at the measles level how they are going to be followed. At the national level, we can saw the first graph is representing the type of residence, whereas green line represent the national level. In the urban area, it is the retention rate is high and in the rural area it is low. And again, the difference between the dose three and dose four of the vaccination. And in, in the next slide, again, it is showing the major gap between the dose three and dose four. And it is similar to the wealth quintile of the household, and it is also similar into the women's uh, education. And here is dropouts comes, like if we 
just I discuss about the dose one, two, three, and dose one, two, three, four. That means those children who received DPT, uh, BCG, DPT one, polio one, DPT two, polio two, and the dose one, two, three is, includes the DPT three and polio three. The larger gap between these two stage, and it is all all similar in the across the background characteristics of the woman. So now comes to the conclusion. Only 50, uh, 52% children aged 12 to 23 months have received the full course of vaccination. Children of the poorest and illiterate mothers have the lowest rate of full immunization. Near about 86% of the children would have fully vaccinated if each child had been administered all their dose of diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, and polio vaccines and measles vaccines. The retention rate of childhood immunization was in the maximum decline between the second round of DPT and polio and the third round of the DPT and polio. On the other hand, if all children are brought under the health system network, by the way of registering all births for BCG, the existing dropout rate at different stages of vaccination will yield 60%, near about the 61% of the children being fully immunized. And finally, the conclusion, the, collect, uh, the finding of this assessment revealed that, oops, sorry. The findings of this assessment reveal that immunization coverage varies from one vaccine to another and declines over the schedule prescribed by the WHO. The BCG, third round of DPT and third round of polio vaccines coverage may play a critical role in full immunization as the dropout rates were higher for these vaccination. Especially designed intervention are needed to meet million, millennium development goals regarding the under five child mortality rate, infant mortality rate, and proportion of one-year-old ch children immunized against measles. And the collection, and finally the acknowledgement, the collection and analysis of data presented hereby conducted as the part of our CH program and were supported by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, and it is part of my PhD program. Thank you very much. Very good, excellent. <clears throat> Thanks to all of the speakers for uh, very good presentations, which I think uh, complemented, uh, their, each complemented the other, I think, very nicely. Now we're going to innovate a bit, or at least uh, adapt a bit our approach to taking questions. Uh, so instead of raising your hand where you are, uh, we'd ask you to please line up at each of three microphones. Uh, there's one between these, uh, between the two aisles here, one here, and then one on this side. So that we'd ask, uh, we'd welcome, of course, all questions and comments, and we'd invite you to please uh, go to one of the microphones. We'll take a round of questions first. We have 20 minutes overall, uh, and then we'll let the panelists uh, respond to the set of questions. So why don't we start on this side, please? Uh, hi, my name is Shafali Oza, and I'm at the London School of Hygiene. My question was for uh, Dr. Merchant. Um, it seems like the work you did to estimate effective coverage for skilled birth attendants was um, quite a large undertaking, where you had linked three um, kind of surveys that you had done. And I was wondering if you have strategies or recommendations for how to kind of expand that to a broader level, um, especially since, for example, across countries, since the differences in reasons for lack of effective coverage that you showed seem to vary a fair amount just between the three sites you had surveyed. And I guess the, the broader topic on that is that as we talk about adding quality uh, as part of a metric, how to kind of maintain the quality of that data itself given how hard it is to, to measure even more basic variables. Great, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, gentlemen here, please. Hi, uh, Shea Redstein from uh, ICF. Uh, international and the demographic and health surveys. Um, I congratulate uh, all the presenters on well done papers and good presentations. Um, but I'd like to ask a question in relation to the global burden of disease. Uh, it appears to me that we have uh, a very narrow focus in terms of looking at interventions that may relieve the global burden of disease, and we're not considering things outside the medical field 
in terms of, for example, you could even talk about transportation for uh, women who are in need of uh, emergency obstetric care. Um, or I guess the JYS program does provide some uh, money so that they can afford to go, but other kinds of interventions uh, in our global burden such as uh, reducing smoking, uh, changing indoor fuels for things such as uh, uh, pneumonia for children, affecting that, um, and I, I address it to the whole panel about looking at interventions outside the medical field as well as just the medical field. Thanks very much. Uh, this side again, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, George Patton from the University of Melbourne. Um, in, in a sense, my question follows on from the last one. Um, I th and it's for the second and third presenters. Uh, you made a really convincing case to say that simple indicators are not going to capture things like uh, skilled attendance, birth, or antenatal care. Um, so I think the case was very clear. But we run into a second problem, which is sometimes being called the epidemic of health indicators if we're actually to do this really well. Um, so I'd really like your thoughts on how countries might actually select the most parsimonious set of indicators that are right for them in capturing coverage. Great, uh, here please, in the middle. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Nirav Patel. I work for NASA Langley Research Center and the World Bank's uh, East Asia and Pacific Division on population mapping efforts. And um, I'm, I had an issue with, um, I had a question about um, how do you guys handle like hostility to, you know, measuring these, uh, you know, interventions? Because I worked in India on my thesis research in the government, for the government of Gujarat on HIV and tuberculosis prevention using uh, network analysis and, um, you know, looking at a metropolitan area with high resolution population data. And I, I was, you know, just giving basic uh, information to the government on, you know, my preliminary results. And I found myself in a situation where, um, you know, Narendra Modi's office, the chief minister of the state, was running an investigation on me. Um, nothing, and you know, kind of pressuring some doctors that I was working with just from giving preliminary results. So I'm kind of in a tough situation there because I don't want my family to be affected over there, that type of thing. So I was wondering if you guys had any advice about that. Thanks. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> this side, please. Hi, my name is Nadine Chan, and I'm a local from our Seattle King County Health Department. And I found your presentations very relevant as we think about how to measure performance um, and how we're doing with the Affordable Care Act beginning um, enrollment later this fall. My question is, as, you're, um, as we're thinking about how do we measure coverage and, more importantly, effective coverage, can you talk about the process that you used to get buy-in from the decision makers when you selected the uh, measures that you chose for effective coverage? Um, and the next question that I have is if you have time, I'd be interested in hearing how decision makers acted on your information, if at all. Thank you. Again, this side, please. Good morning. My name is Carly Levitz, and I'm a fellow at IHME. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Yadav. I noticed in addition to the dropout rate between doses three and four, I also noticed that the um, polio retention was higher than the DPT retention, even though they have the same vaccination schedule. And I wondered what lessons you learned, uh, why polio uh, was doing better than DPT in terms of uh, retention. And then my other question was for Dr. Marchant. When you were looking at the proportion of um, facilities that had what they needed for uh, the supplies to prevent infection, in the uh, region in India did better than Ethiopia. But then when, um, and then in terms of the skilled birth attendants who actually used supplies when they existed, Ethiopia was around 40% of the skilled birth attendants, but India was around 10, and I was wondering why that discrepancy existed and what Ethiopia was doing uh, to, excuse me, to uh, get more of their skilled birth attendants to use the supplies when they existed. Thank you. <laughs> this side, please. Hi, my name's Marilyn Burko. I'm a pediatrician and a student in uh, public health at the University of Washington. And my question is, um, essentially, I think, to summarize all of your studies, they show uh, diminished effective coverage. 
And um, my question is, are you working uh, collaboratively with policy implementation in your respective countries, or could you do so? Because uh, I think we'd make faster progress mm -hmm. if uh, these results were immediately available and implementable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actionable, I think is the term. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir, please. Hello, my name is Alejandro Orella. I am from Fed Foundation, which is an NGO based in Colombia that works also in Central and South America. We have been working for, for a long time in quality of uh, antenatal health services, uh, and we, we see difference between prevalence and uh, when we follow up uh, patients, and, uh, and we figure out that we have different results. Uh, so we were, we were wondering that, of course, when, when you look for the information in different way, you get different results. So which alternative or what kind of alternative do you figure out uh, to, to solve this situation and, and how this can be transferred to, to the policy makers to, to improve their quality of the information and their capacity to make decisions? Great, uh, thanks for the questions. So why don't we stop there, have a first round of comments and then um, Looks like we, we will have some time for a second round of comments. So if there are others who would like to come forward um, in a few minutes after we've heard from each of the panelists, you'd be most welcome to do so. Let's go in reverse order now. Uh, so uh, Divakar, uh, why don't you uh, start off and then we'll come down the line this way. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I would like to respond to the question why the polio is doing better than the DPT. Uh, one probable reason is that there is a lot of focus on the polio reduction or uh, polio reduction and, we, and it is also the part of the donor section like those who are providing the funds to remove these uh, infection, disease, viruses from the developing countries. So it's almost because of the more focus, more concentrate on the polio, not on the DPT. DPT is the routine immunization program. So anyway, uh, anyhow, in any condition, DPT program and measles program is affected by the polio's program. And then second thing is that how it is going to be helped to the policy makers and implementers. So as a developing nations, India, we have a information at the district level, which represents each part of the nation, and we can give a real picture of the situation where we can make a, uh, regional policies programs according to the available information from the cross-sectional surveys. Like in this uh, presentation, as we found that we have a larger dropout between the dose three to dose four. For this reason, this uh, difference, we don't have any information. But uh, still, we have to manage to the policymakers, to implementers. Anyhow, this is the major gap in the children's immigration. That's why we are not going to achieve our the national population policy and the national health policy targets. And then we have to plan accordingly how to achieve this, the targets like uh, in India, national population policy has declared uh, they achieve the 80 percent full Im fully immunization by the 2010. But still, we are behind the targets. So again, we have to thought that how to how we are able to achieve the national targets for the full immunization of the children. So again, there is a, another. Uh, and this approach is going to help at the economic level where we are shrinking at the uh, part of the financial terms. So it is going to help how to manage all those funds with the WHO schedule and we can improve our uh, routine immunization schedule and we can achieve within a uh, required time frame. Thank you for all those wonderful questions. 
Um, in answer to the question about an examining an expanded set of interventions, for example, transportation or uh, indoor fuel, uh, the po I think the point you raised is a very good one. Uh, I think that there is indeed a lot of other indicators that and interventions that are important that aren't recognized as often uh, and aren't included in the standard list of indicators, for example, in the MDGs. <laughs> With respect to something like transportation, I think that the it, trans, issue of transportation is incorporated in some, some of these indicators of effective coverage. So for example, if a woman isn't making it to antenatal care, in part that's because of transportation. So we can capture that, that intervention within the larger scheme of antenatal care effective coverage. And in regards to other interventions, I do think there's more that we can be do to be incorporating those, those interventions as well. Which brings us to the issue of the epidemic of indicators. And that's a, that's a very good point as well. Um, the point you raise is a very, very good one. And uh, th there really is a lot of tensions between what we know is important and what we can measure well. And between having all the information that we need and, be, and being parsimonious with what information is the most important. There's also a lot of tension between selecting indicators that reflect the highest burden at the global level and selecting indicators that are relevant to the most countries. And I think these are all tensions that require, will require discussion, particularly as we approach the post-millennium development goal era. And I think that uh, collaboration from a number of experts in each of these fields will help us resolve some of those tensions. And in regards to policy implementation and translating this information to decision makers, for the SM2015 project, this is that, uh, the translating of the information that we're gathering to ministries of health and decision makers is an integral, integral part of the project. And data collection for Mexico was finalized last week and we're already disseminating that information. Thank you. Um, so I'll address the last one of the last questions first, I think, which was about the, the question about um, frontline workers preparing essential items in our study and availability of items for infection prevention in facilities. And just to make clear that those were two different data sources. One was looking at what was standing and available in health facilities. And one question was asking skilled birth attendants about what they had in their bag that was made ready for the, um, for the birth that they attended. So they're two different data sources. Um, I think overall, I've got three main comments to make around, because there was some overlap in the questions and they were all really relevant. Um, one of the things is about getting buy-in. And I think it, the, in my experience, large-scale data collection methods do encourage buy-in from governments from policy makers, from large scale implementers. They encourage buy in beyond, above and beyond small demonstration project evidence. Um, and how do you try to, one of the questions about how do you implement these sorts of um, data collection methods on a large scale? Well, I could say that within the ideas project, two things contributed to the success of the data that we collected. One was using personal digital assistance. I'm a big fan of that, so that you can look at the quality of the data that you're collecting as you proceed, so that data is visible in light, is, is visible live. Um, but the other thing is about applying standardized routine methodologies that are clearly documented and written down to the extent possible. We worked with, um, in all of the data collection activities that I'm engaged in, we work with um, partners in country and I think their engagement, their buy-in to these standardized methodologies are incredibly important. The work that I presented actually is not very novel in its approach. We currently conduct regularly large-scale household surveys and large-scale facility readiness surveys. It's the linking of those two things that I think is a next step that we need to be making. Um, one of the things about, another thing about buy-in and perhaps protecting yourself from um, adverse effects from presenting data. Um, I think that 
starting right from the beginning and thinking about the processes that are required in order for health impacts to be achieved is incredibly important. And doing that thinking process with the people, with the stakeholders on the ground. So some sort of even a light touch pathway analysis so that you sit down at the outset with people who care about what you're going to say about them and have a shared conversation, not about the end point, but about the steps that need to take place before you get there, so that you have a common understanding before you just turn up a year later and provide information. And the other thing about, about having people buy into your information is to not, pre not present them with problems, but present them with data that has a possible solution. So I'm a real believer in presenting data in real time to people who can take action to improve and moving beyond that sort of, I think we've moved beyond the RCT style approach when we come to me measuring effective coverage. Um, Yeah, and then how do you select indicators? This will be my final point, and it's maybe a little plug for the work that I'm doing within the Ideas Project. I don't have an absolute answer, but I think clearly we need to, because of what we know about effective coverage and the gap between coverage um, of an, from an interaction, so um, a skill birth attendant being there or an antenatal care um, visit taking place, it's clear that we need to be more comprehensive and think about at least three sets of indicators for anything that we're interested in. Did a meeting take place between a person who needs care and a person who can provide care? What was the content of that interaction? And I think a lot of the time that's what we talk about when we talk about quality. What actually took place between those two individuals? And then what's the coverage of the life-saving intervention that arose as a result? and trying to cover those three bases for any health outcome that we're interested in, I think provides invaluable information. Just uh, before Badat uh, provides his response, <clears throat> we do have a few more minutes for um, any last uh, burning questions or comments. So uh, while Badat is speaking, we'd invite any of you to uh, step forward to one of the microphones uh, for a last, uh, last short round of questions and comments. Thanks. Thank you for this uh, raging question on uh, medical and uh, non-medical uh, reasons and the contribution of uh, medical and non-medical factors in the uh, disease uh, and morbidity. Uh, the background for this study of coverage under the JSY uh, program is that India has made huge investment. Whatever federal governments uh, provide, allocate money to the uh, provincial government, around 50% money goes on this program. And the uh, fact we are seeing that there is a sharp increase in institutional deliveries, but quality of that uh, service services provided at the facility are uh, uh, there are many problems. And if you see the trends in uh, uh, increase in institutional delivery over the last seven years and the trends in maternal mortality, there is, instead, in, uh, instead of sharp increase, there is no um, uh, sudden uh, decrease in the maternal mortality. Maternal mortality is uh, following the same trend. So that means that there is a problem, mothers are reaching the facility, but there is a problem at the facility level. Something is not happening as needed. So that's why we have focused on the problem at, in the facility. And the uh, crucial part to save lives of mothers is the providing emergency obstetric care. And in that, mostly the life-saving uh, component is the cesarean section and uh, blood. So uh, that's the one reason we took uh, the medical uh, cause. Of course, other reasons contributing uh, transport facilities and other is uh, very, very important. Second is about this buy-in for this research, uh, buy-in from the results of this uh, studies. Definitely there is a need to create a space between, uh, uh, between the government policymaker and researcher. There is a need to set a dialogue. There is a need to create a platform where voices from the researcher 
voices from the civil society organizations, voices from the activists are, are uh, listened and policies are based on these voices. They, uh, at, at this moment, there is no such kind of formal platform. Informally, we, uh, whenever we, uh, we have opportunity or we, we, have, we have a space, we make a voice, but most of the time, these voices are not listened. So policies are not based on the research or not even, these are the facts of different countries. We need, the research community need to work on this and we need to study the, how the policy in the different countries are made. And mostly policies are made by their political agendas and uh, what are the thing that will give the political mileage. And JSY is the product of that uh, philosophy. So of course there is a need to create a space and this space is not there. Uh, great, now to our last lightning round of questions and comments. So first I'll invite the, uh, the two uh, persons in the middle here, uh, and then the three on the left-hand side, then we'll, we'll stop it uh, there, just for then a very quick wrap up before we go to lunch. So uh, over to you, uh, grateful if you could here. keep it uh, okay. concise, thanks. I'll try to be. My name is Mary Bassett, I'm from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. We're funding, uh, now in our fourth year funding projects that aim uh, to strengthen health systems at district level, which is perhaps why I can't help but note that one of the key barriers to effective coverage is the health system. And uh, I just wonder um, from all of the panelists if you've thought about how to frame your findings as health systems indicators in addition to population coverage. Hi, my name is Nick Kassebaum from IHME. Uh, my question is for Bharat. Um, I agree very much that C-section is an important intervention to prevent maternal mortality and also poor neonatal outcomes. However, uh, I, I do have a question about the, the level that you count as effective coverage. 5%, uh, there's good evidence that that's very, very low, and even 10% uh, is is quite low. There's some suggestion that the, the rate should be as high as 20 to 25 percent to be considered actually effective. Um, and then second, very quickly, is that a lot of indicators that we look at are just yes-no questions. Do you have this? Um, interventions in more developed health facilities look at quality of intervention or process of intervention. Um, is there any uh, look into implementing that and how we gather data. Hi, I'm Casey Tesfai from the International Rescue Committee. Just another question. He almost took my question, but uh, it's more of a follow-on question for Tanya. Um, you mentioned that it was a limitation of not having an individual indicator. And it's my opinion that an effective coverage should include some element of a quality individual indicator of care. And I'm just wondering, particularly as we're talking about accountability, that just having services in place don't necessarily mean that they're good quality services and being accountable to the people that the services are there to serve. So I was just wondering if you've had any thoughts on including an individual quality indicator to determine the effective coverage. Thanks. So let me follow that up um, with a very precise question. The Commission on Information and Accountability recommended 11 indicators to track progress on MDGs 4, 5, and 1C. None of them are covering quality at all. And we've been struggling with how can we measure quality. So can I encourage you to contribute to the epidemic of indicators um, and come off the fence and give, give us two indicators that measure quality, one for MDG4, one for MDG5, that we could include in our IERG report for 2013. Hello, uh, I'm Kaja Abbas from Virginia Tech. And this question is primarily for Bharat Randev. Like why you did indicate an association that the JS by conditional cash transfer program led to an increase in institutional births. How much of it is the attributable impact of the program that led to the increase in institutional births. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, great. Let's move now to uh, lightning response round or lightning question round. So I heard specific questions in there for Tanya and Bharat. Uh, so if the two of you could respond quickly, that's good. And of course, uh, Divakar and uh, Ellie would invite you to jump in as you as you see fit as well. Thanks. So I'm going to go first. Um, thank you. So on health system uh, evaluations, Yes, absolutely. And we do have members of our team who are doing bottleneck analyses from the health system perspective. So obviously I wasn't able to present all of the range of work that we're doing, but we do have that bottleneck analysis taking place to see where effectiveness is being reduced. Okay. And then, um, yes, I would love beyond anything to have an individual indicator on quality of care for the intrapartum period, but I think... Um, Somebody asked earlier about the importance of quality data collection. And when our experience is that when you ask women about events that happened to them in the intrapartum period, you have a huge number of missing responses because people often just don't know what the, the birth attendants were doing. Um, so this is where there's a tension between small-scale observational studies and what you can capture from a large-scale study. Certainly antenatally, postpartum and postnatal, which is also part of the work that we're doing within IDEAS, absolutely we, want, we, we measure individual level effective coverage indicators. And this speaks then to Richard's question about what would be my indicator for quality. It would be around content of care. So it would be around five core elements of care provided antenatally by the end of pregnancy, plus five core elements of postpartum and postnatal care delivered within two days of birth. And if we can roll that into one indicator, it can be measured at the individual level. I think it speaks volumes. Uh, first question about this uh, caesarean section rate. Uh, in uh, this study, I uh, took very uh, conservative estimate of minimum 5%. Of course, uh, there's a range, uh, the range is in between 5 to 15% need. The different uh, estimates are there. And in uh, different set, there are more than 25, 30% caesarean rate is also there. But if you say appropriate, it ranges from 5% to 15%. But even considering most conservative estimate, there is huge gap, and you can imagine if you, if I consider uh, season rate higher, there will be a, there will be more gap than that. About this contribution, uh, about the impact of uh, JSY in the institutional delivery, there are studies which have estimated, uh, which, have, which did a difference in difference analysis and estimated that JSY contributed uh, uh, in the increase in institutional delivery. Of course, in this study, it's not uh, part of this study. But uh, in a one graph that I showed, the trend, uh, after the 2005 when JSY launched, there is a sudden increase in institutional delivery. And there are different studies also that have shown that. I'd just like to respond to Richard Horton's question. Uh, I think Dr. Marchant articulated very well an excellent indicator for MDG5 and maternal health. For MDG4 and child health, I think that an indicator that incorporates the prevalence of antibodies for each vaccination would be extremely useful. Well, the response to how to measuring effective coverage of intervention I would say that uh, these cross-sectional surveys gives a real picture of the regional system of uh, regional or geographical position of the nation, where we can just assess the ongoing program, how they are going to perform, how they are performing, and whether it would be uh, is uh, whether it would be, uh, would be possible to make a new programs or just incorporate or, and modify and then apply. And the next point is that it's all the cross-sectional programs is giving uh, coverage 
it's giving a district level prevalence of the immunization or any kind of health indicators and uh, <clears throat> it's a it's a going to help the programs where we can try to incorporate with the others and just reduce the program cost and uh, implement these programs in the new uh, design with the new uh, design types because of always if we talking about the programs finance comes first so we should always think about how to reduce the program cost and just uh, improve our the health system performance and then we can uh, utilize our health system and uh, then we can achieve the mdg's goals with the national uh, defined nation defined targets Great. <laughs> well, I'd like to close by thanking all of the panelists for their excellent presentations and a very stimulating discussion. I'd also like to thank all of the participants who raised questions and contributed to the discussion. I think it was very rich and, and very useful. Just to summarize in a couple of words, I think we heard overall um, that there is a very strong need to move beyond tracking crude coverage to begin to tracking effective coverage more systematically. I haven't heard anyone challenge that notion uh, at all. I think that uh, when we have scratched below the surface of crude coverage and across different program areas and different settings, we've seen very large differences between crude and effective, crude and effective coverage. We, I think we've seen that vary by program type. I think we've seen that vary by country setting. And uh, also, I think there was a very important, important point in one of the presentations that uh, there also does appear to be a bigger discrepancy between crude coverage and effective coverage within a context of rapid scale up of intervention coverage. I think this is a very important one to, for us to keep our eye on as we move towards the um, MDG uh, target year of 2015 as we think about the period beyond. Um, I think that that's a particular type of situation that requires an, an extra eye. So clearly the picture overall is more complex and a little bit less optimistic in terms of levels of coverage being achieved than, than is often put forward um, in broader discourses on where we are in health and health coverage. I think that's ultimately not surprising, but at the same time, these are clear gaps that we need to take seriously and that we need to begin to think about addressing. I'd like to just counter, provide one counterpoint here to close on in relation to the, the question about number of indicators. Uh, to me, the solution would not be to dr double or triple the number of indicators that we're tracking. To me, a, a better solution would be to incorporate the systematic investigation of effective coverage and even quality into an analysis plan of our existing indicators, a little bit like we think of equity. So I think that um, uh, now in most cases, we're not treating equity as a separate set of indicators or as a separate indicator or set of indicators. Rather, equity is normally incorporated into an analysis plan so that Coverage indicators across a range of programs are examined from an equity lens. Equity across wealth quintiles, across geographic areas, uh, by sex of recipient, et cetera. I would propose that this is also an effective uh, approach to think about uh, quality and effectiveness in. And I think that, for example, within the 11 COYA indicators, uh, to me it would be very reductionist to try to put forward uh, one or even two indicators of quality across a range of program areas. Either we have to selectively just choose one or two program areas, or we have to collapse information from across a number of programs, then it's going to be so reductionist that it's going to be difficult to interpret. So I would uh, posit instead that we should think of this as an analysis plan, and that all of the 11 indicators within the COYA context, and then all of the all of a, a country's indicators within its national M&E plan uh, should be analyzed from the perspective of quality and effective coverage. I think that um, when it comes to the country level, I think that the guiding document here should be the, uh, a national m and &E plan and framework uh, that should uh, move beyond just a, a laundry list of indicators, but address institutional roles and responsibilities, the need for capacity strengthening, the analytical plan, and so forth, and that ideally that should also involve research and technical institutions. We've had very good questions around the use of such data and how we can bridge the divide between researchers or the ME people and then decision makers, I think one way to do that is to incorporate this type of analysis systematically into countries' review, existing review mechanisms and review cycles. Uh, and I think that uh, clearly also, I just want to flag, I think there's an, a very important innovation agenda around this as well. We've had some very exciting conversations around biomarkers, um, innovative triangulation techniques, uh, linkage of data sources, um, household survey, health facility, et cetera. But uh, <coughs> clearly there is a role for um, innovation in driving this forward. 
With that, I'll close. Thanks very much.